Well, hi, everybody. A uh, couple new ones and uh, others who were here last week. Uh, we, what we're doing over the course of the next few weeks is looking at the subject of worry uh, exclusively or almost exclusively in the Gospels. Uh, and we, we talked quite a bit last week about whether or not uh, worrying is a sin. And I think the conclusion we came to is that worry is more just part of being human. In fact, it's part of being alive, not even human, uh, because animals can worry just as much as we can. Uh, we're maybe a little bit better at it and more creative about it than they are because of the way our brains work. But worry is a sin if we don't involve God in it. We talked about, well, and throughout the course of the week, we're going to talk about some of the things that can worry us the most, specifically uh, loss, change, and a painful event. Uh, last week, we looked at uh, how the, the Jewish leaders worried about that. They worried about loss uh, and change so much that they denied what was so clearly in front of them, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, they were worried about losing their position. Uh, we're going to talk tonight uh, a little bit about unworthiness, uh, the worries we might have about our own unworthiness, or mistakes, or missed opportunities. Um, in the coming weeks, we're going to talk about how uh, we worry about finances and possessions uh, and political events, politics and, and other world events, how those can worry us. And we'll talk about uh, the worry that our families can cause us. And uh, I, I said last week that I identified about 70 distinct instances of worry in the gospel. That word doesn't appear all of the time, but if we put ourselves in the situation, we can see that really worry was very much present in the story. So last week I left you with the question, oh, let me flip to my slides here first. Uh, share. Slides. Um, Good. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to from current slide. There we go. Okay. The question I left you with last week is, did Jesus worry? But you know, what about Jesus himself? Did he worry about anything? Did he have any fears? Well, I believe he did. But how could he? He had perfect faith, didn't he? So how could Jesus fear anything? He knew God was in complete control. So why would Jesus have anything at all to worry about? His humanity. Excuse me? His humanity. His humanity. Yeah, you know, I think that uh, that certainly played into it. Uh, as he approached his death, he probably worried about his ability to uh, see it through, possibly. But let me ask you, at what point in his life do you believe that Jesus understood the story of Isaac and the ram caught in the thicket? How old was he when he, he understood the story of Moses uh, holding the serpent up on the pole for everyone to look to? When did he grasp that he was the Passover lamb? How many years did he carry around with him an understanding of the full meaning of Isaiah 53? And as we read this, 
imagine that you know that these words, what Isaiah had written hundreds of years earlier, that you know that these words are about you. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him, esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. You know, it is unfortunately very easy for us to be dispassionate about what we just read, to read it without any feeling, to not feel it at all. We know these words, or some of us know these words so well, and we can get lost in the poetry and lose the emotion. But I promise you that if you knew that these words were written specifically about you, it would be different. You and I would certainly worry. Well, do we hold Jesus to a higher standard and believe that it's not possible that he would worry too? Do we think it might have been wrong for him to worry about it? Here are the words. Wounded. Bruised. Imprisoned. Whipped slaughtered, buried. We're meant to reflect on this when we take the bread and wine. Do you believe Jesus didn't reflect on it? Look forward to it with trepidation every day? You know, some would say, I asked how old was he when he understood these things about himself? Some would suggest that when he was 12 years old and was in the temple asking the religious leaders of the day questions that they struggled to answer, some would suggest that he was asking these questions. Well, about a year or so ago, uh, my wife and I went to the Bible Museum in Washington, D.C. Uh, we couldn't recommend it any more highly. One room was an exhibit about life in Nazareth and the towns along the lake at the time of Jesus. And actors played roles and they described day-to-day -day life. In one spot, we looked down off of a hilltop and saw the towns that we all know side by side. Capernaum, Gennesaret, Bethsaida, Agdala and the towns nearby like Nazareth and Cana. It was so easy to see this small area where Jesus spent so much time. And an actor playing the role of a stonemason explained that there were only a few hundred people in the village of Nazareth. So everyone knew Jesus. Most would have known him well. Matthew 13, Mark 6, and Luke 4 are parallel accounts of the time that Jesus went back to his hometown and taught in the synagogue. Luke gives the more detailed account, including his reading from Isaiah. 
The people, it says, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. But they couldn't accept him for who he was because they had known him all their lives. And Jesus said, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town and except among his relatives and except in his home. There, no one thinks he's anything. He couldn't be anything. We've known him his whole life. How could he be anything? In fact, he went on to say that foreigners, like the widow of Zarephath and Naaman the leper, stories from the Old Testament, were far more open and accepting, and therefore were more acceptable than these people who had known Jesus his whole life were. Of course, these people who had known him his whole life couldn't bear to hear this from him. And so it says all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off of the cliff. But he walked right out through the crowd and went on his way. So this was Jesus' first brush with death that we're aware of, where he grew up, in this tiny town where he knew these people. And they all knew him. And they all knew his family. And his family was right there, too. In this tiny town, everyone would have known everyone else pretty well. And let's not forget that his disciples were there, and they experienced this too. Jesus may have been tough, but their skin was probably a bit thinner. So how did they process this event? The next event in Mark, and which seems to be the next event chronologically, was the sending out of the twelve. Reading instead from Matthew, it says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors as kings and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, not if, but when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Well, was Jesus speaking only to his disciples? Or was he using the words he would also say to himself? He says very similar words again that we'll get to. But next, chronologically, is what appears in Mark 8. The Pharisees came and began to question Jesus. To test him, they asked him for a sign from heaven. He sighed deeply and said, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Then he left them, got back into the boat, and crossed to the other side. He sighed deeply. Why is that recorded? The Bible tends to be very spare in its description of emotions. So why are we told this? Why did he sigh? You know, it's easy for us to say that he sighed from exasperation because what had he been doing other than miracles that were clearly signs from heaven? But perhaps the sigh was because these men who would bring about his death gave him yet another reason to remember that it was coming and it was going to be horrible. On a separate occasion, sometime later, 
he says the same thing. Jesus was driving a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, By Beelzebul, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. As the crowds increased, Jesus said, This is a wicked generation. It asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. You know, we read that, and I think our natural reaction is to think, Oh, yeah, Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, just like Jesus was in the grave for three days. It's that simple. It's academic to us. But it wasn't academic to Jesus. It would take something out of him to say, you want a sign? I'll show you a sign. But first, I have to be killed horribly by you. So surely there is emotion there. He goes on to list multiple woes on the Pharisees, laying bare their hypocrisies and their blasphemies. He held nothing back. Then, at the end of chapter 11, it says the Pharisees besieged him with questions to catch him in something he might say. With this fresh in mind, chapter 12 begins. And I would ask again, is he saying this as much to himself as he is to the disciples? He's just had a very rough encounter with the men he knew would kill him. So was he confirming the truth to himself as much as to his disciples? When this passage reads, Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, saying, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I tell you, whoever publicly acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will also acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever disowns me before others will be disowned before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Isaiah prophesies about Christ's mindset when he went to Jerusalem for the last time. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint and I know that I shall not be ashamed. How old was he when he first understood that Isaiah was channeling his own mind? And how many times did Jesus resort to these words that his father gave him through Isaiah as a source of comfort? His father gave him these words to comfort him. 
in a very clear passage close to the time of his death. In fact, in the same chapter, John 12, where we're told that even some leaders believed in him but were afraid to say anything because of the Pharisees, we have these words about Jesus' own mental state. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Finally, on that last night, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Sorrow to the point of death. Is it safe to call this worry? I would suggest that when he sweated great drops of blood, there could have been only three reasons. Either he was worried about the physical torture that would go on for hours, or he was worried that he would fail at the last minute. You mentioned his humanity. That he wouldn't be able to endure it sinlessly doing his father's will. Or maybe he was worried about the effect that the coming hours would have on his disciples, particularly over the three-day period that he would not be with them. His prayer was, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. So, did Jesus worry? It may be a matter of semantics, but I would say yes, he certainly did. Though he also had perfect faith. So worry itself is not a sin. It is a sin if faith is not involved. Did he let the thorns of living in this world get in the way? No. His faith was too great for that. Did Jesus' intense feelings about his impending death separate him from God? Of course not. It's my sense that Jesus dealt with worries of his own and so understands perfectly our worries. He also dealt on a daily basis, either directly or indirectly, with the worries of all the people who crowded around him. He was swarmed by people who lived in a hard, cruel world. People who were in need, not only of a shepherd, but of spiritual, emotional, and physical healing. So it's my sense that Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, is eminently qualified to understand and help us with our anxieties, without judgment. And let's not forget that Jesus was not alone in his ministry. Others were impacted, probably quite deeply, by things that were said and done. We're told that because Jesus was healing on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. Even if these increasingly bold and vicious attacks didn't cause Jesus to worry for himself. Remember, there were at least 12 men with him. Maybe more when you consider the men who traveled with them also and the crowds. How did these attacks on their teacher affect them? I don't think there's any question they had cause to worry. We see that in them later when it says that Jesus set his eyes like flint to go to Jerusalem. When Jesus predicted and talked about his death over and over again, we're told the disciples didn't understand. 
but were afraid to ask Jesus to explain. Were they afraid of Jesus? Of what he would say to them? Or were they afraid because maybe they just didn't really want to know? When Peter told Jesus to stop thinking that he was going to die, was he speaking out of a bit out of his own fear? All right, let's uh, let's sh let's shift gears a little bit here. And I'd like to bring this a little closer home maybe for some of us, and I'd like to talk about unworthiness, making a mistake and the possibility of worrying about that. I believe it's possible, actually I know it's possible, to worry that we might not be found acceptable at Christ's return. Did, I'm sorry, did somebody say something? No. Okay. It's very, it's very worthwhile to analyze where this feeling of unworthiness comes from. We all know in our heads that we're saved by faith and not by works. But we may sense that we're not particularly faithful. In fact, we know that we're nowhere near the ideal. Do we have faith the size of a mustard seed? And we also know that works are an outward sign of our faith. Little works suggest little faith. Many works suggest lots of faith, at least to the human eye. To understand where this feeling of worth unworthiness comes from, we have to ask, what is sin? Sounds like a terrible topic, but this question actually helped me to understand grace. Let's start with the Old Covenant under Moses. What's a sin under the Old Covenant? A sin under the Mosaic Law was things that we do that are wrong. Then how about, that sounds pretty simple, right? Doing something wrong is a sin. Well, now, how about under the New Covenant, the New Testament? Well, suddenly, things we think that are wrong are also a sin. Every time we think, or more accurately, every time we harbor the thought and dwell on it, some, something sinful, we need forgiveness. Whether we do it or not, every lust every jealousy, every moment of envy and anger and resentment and hate and prejudice. They're not doing something, but they're dark and evil, sinful thoughts. Anything else? Is there anything else that's a sin? I'll throw that out to the group. Yeah, yeah, that's in James. That's uh, in my least favorite verse in the Bible. Yeah. Him that knoweth to do good and doing it not, to him uh -huh. it is a sin. Yeah. That's right. Excuse me? No. Okay. Well, and a very similar thought is in Romans 14. It says, everything that does not come from faith is sin. That actually ratchets it up even a little bit further. So all of these horrible things we do and these horrible thoughts are only sins of commission. We commit these acts and we commit these thoughts. And even the not so horrible things that don't stem from or somehow involve faith maybe, 
like worry. Maybe those can be sins. Those are sins. If it doesn't come from faith, it's a sin. Well, what about anything we don't do? How much greater are our sins of omission? Not doing or thinking something bad is one thing, but how do we account for not doing or not thinking the absolute best we could in every situation, every moment of every day? Let me give you an example. Let's say it's not your turn to help with some chore that needs to be done around your church, but you pitch in anyway. Good for me, you might think. If you think you have any merit because of this, you've essentially gone back under the law. That's a sin of attempted justification by works, and it's an act of pride. But what if you didn't think good for me or anything like that? What if you thought, I have time, so I want to help? That's better. But, you know, again, who knows what attitude is really lurking behind that? It could still be legalistic. It could be maybe you're thinking that somebody will help you with something someday in return. It could be you want to be seen doing it. God knows. <coughs> Excuse me. But let's say he finds you even pure at that level and wholly congruent in your act of love. Yet, why didn't you help with the next chore? Or all of the chores? Didn't you think of it? Or did you think of it and hold back? If you could have, but didn't, then it's an omission. Now you might say, well, that's not really a sin. But I think the omission is what we haven't yet grown up to in Christ. And I think now we're really getting at the main theology of sin in the new covenant. It's not so much what we've done amiss, but what we haven't yet done or even thought of doing, but could be doing. Omissions come when we don't preach freely when we don't give freely, or lend freely, or help freely, or love freely, or serve freely. Sins of omission lie in our failure to become who we ought to be in Christ. Sins of omissions lie in the fact that we are not Christ's equal. You pointed out that James says, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So you have to be consciously choosing to not do something before it's a sin. But I would suggest that any time we could be doing good, even if we're not thinking about it, it is an omission, whether you want to call it a sin or not. Can you imagine that Christ never had a sin of omission? He never thought of something he could have been doing, but chose not to do it. Even with his dying breaths, he fought to fulfill scripture and to teach. There are lessons that he was still teaching with his very last breaths. Under the law, Sin was defined as doing wrong behavior. Under grace, we move from behavior to the realm of values and thoughts and beliefs. Sins of commission now includes things in our heart like lust and envy and pride and judging, whether we actually physically do anything or not. But if all that is not of faith is sin, then faith goes beyond doing something bad or thinking something bad or even 
failing to do good. Sin must be defined as falling short in our quest to live in faith and in love. When we think about things we can do or that we might do, we should not so much think, well, what's wrong with it? But rather, what's right with it? Is it consistent with the growth of my faith? Does it help someone else grow in faith? Are you feeling better now? Probably not. Knowing you're more sinful than you thought you were a minute ago doesn't help you? Does it give you something else to worry about? Well, let me tell you how this helps me. To me, the beauty of this is that paradoxically, while I suddenly have more sins than I ever could have imagined, I can now truly see the futility of trying to earn my salvation or of thinking that I could ever be owed eternal life. I can more clearly see just how much God's promises really are a gift. In an odd way, it's almost freeing to come to the realization that I am so ridiculously hopeless that any rules or measures that I might put in place for myself or, or feel from my association with others are barely even the tip of the iceberg of how far short I can fall and how much I must rely on God's grace. You know, we most commonly recite the version of the Lord's Prayer that says, forgive us our trespasses. But the one in Matthew 6 says, forgive us our debts. I think what that means is, forgive us our omissions. So now that we're on the same playing field, understanding that while things we do wrong are certainly sins, so are things we think, and so are the many, many, many things we don't do but could, let's return to the subject of worrying about our unworthiness. Now that we understand truly that nobody is anything close to worthy, in fact, everybody's best is only filthy rags. Luke 7 says, when Jesus had finished saying all of this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with him. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd, following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. And Mark tells us that as a result, his whole household believed. So, here we have a case of someone with incredible faith, again, a non-Jew, and we tend to focus on that. But for some reason, 
he also felt unworthy. He said he didn't deserve Jesus to come to his house. Can we have that same concern? Did this man ever learn to have confidence? If so, how? It's important to note as well that Jesus didn't address this sense of unworthiness directly, but he only healed. One suggestion I've seen is that the centurion knew that by Jewish custom, he was unworthy because if Jesus entered his house, Jesus would be defiled in the eyes of the Jews. Maybe that's true. But the centurion didn't say, I am not worthy. He actually says, I did not consider myself worthy. Interesting, he says, he doesn't deserve Jesus to come with him. But the Jewish elders, the elders said that he was very deserving. The chronology I was following places the first 11 verses of Luke 5 immediately after the event that we just read about here in Luke 7. In Luke 5, Jesus is calling his first disciples. These men were probably there when Jesus healed the centurion's servant. So the men would have heard what the centurion said. <coughs> Excuse me. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Oh, what a strange reaction from Peter, isn't it? It's possible that, people, that Peter got caught up momentarily in the greed of having all of these fish. His nets were breaking, and the boats were sinking, and oh, what a great haul, and the money it was worth. But then Peter steps back, and recognizes what he's doing, that his mind is leading him astray. But Jesus sits there in the boat and calmly says, don't be afraid. You haven't upset me. You don't have anything to be afraid of. I believe that if the chronology is right, Peter was still affected by the centurion saying that he didn't consider himself worthy to be in Jesus' presence. And he related to that due to his own sinfulness. And so he considered himself to also be unworthy of being so close to his Lord. Moving forward in Luke 8, we have the account of Jairus and his daughter, similar in some ways to the centurion and his servant. But this story is interrupted by the account of the woman with the issue of blood. We'll look instead at the more complete account in Mark. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. 
She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. She fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him what she had done. Was she afraid that he would be angry for some reason? Because she had stolen healing power from him? She could feel immediately that it had worked, that she had been healed. Was she afraid of being the center of attention? We don't know. We can only try to transport ourselves into her position and imagine how we would have felt. And I think that's the beauty of a passage like this. Trying to put ourselves in her place. And Jesus tells her that she was healed by her faith and to go in the peace that passes understanding, freed from her suffering. In a similar way, there's the story about the woman caught in adultery. We're not specifically told how she felt about being the center of attention, but we can certainly try to imagine the fear and shame and horror that she felt as they hovered over her and argued. Again, put yourself there. Do you feel for her? How would you have felt? Like you wanted to crawl in a hole and die? But Jesus is nothing but kind and gentle and merciful and gracious and he saves her the prodigal son was sure that he was unworthy and was certainly worried about how he would be accepted when he came to his senses he said how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare and here i am starving to death i will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Remember, this wasn't real. It was a story that Jesus told to make it clear that our worthiness is not the issue. God's everlasting love is the point. Worry is normal, but not where we should place our focus. And Jesus tells us not to focus on worry by giving us a story about a worry son and a worried father, too, I might add, without actually addressing the worry directly. This young man, it says, came to his senses, meaning he recognized the love that his father had for him, and he wanted to return. But then, as a balance, Jesus tells another story about worry. 
that another servant came and said, Sir, here's your amina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you were a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Unlike the prodigal son who came to his senses and realized that his father had always cared for him and wanted what was best for him, this man was always afraid of his Lord. He misjudged his Lord. He never understood that he would be given so much more if he only appreciated and used what he was given. Or maybe if he had begged for forgiveness as the prodigal son had, so his Lord judged this man just as he anticipated that he would. Love is the proper motivation, not fear. And perfect love casts out fear. At the transfiguration, Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. The parallel account in Mark says he only said this because they were so frightened he didn't know what to say. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Why were they afraid? They were just told, this is my beloved son. I, I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Oh, what did they have to be afraid of? Why were they afraid? First on seeing Moses and Elijah, and somehow knowing who they were, and Jesus transfigured, and then a voice from God, to me, I think this event is a reflection of what it will be like at the judgment seat. So again, why were they afraid? Did they consider themselves unworthy to be there? But Jesus just tells them, not to be afraid. Would that, will that, when that time comes, and it will for each of us, will that be enough for you or for me? <coughs> it's hard to know today sitting here, isn't it? One last example of the fear of unworthiness. Matthew 26, when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the 12, and while they were eating, he said, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, surely you don't mean me, Lord. Again, can you put yourself in their place? Can you imagine if Jesus were here, and said that someone in this room would betray him? Would you wonder about yourself? Would you play scenarios through your mind without even understanding what was about to happen? Could it be me? Would I do it? And yet in contrast, and within minutes of this, Peter is far too confident or perhaps telling himself that he was confident, saying that he was ready to die with Jesus. Not true. That was not true. And Jesus told him that he should not be so confident. 
So let's stop there for this evening and I'll just open it up for a bit. I know uh, Ray told me that last week you all uh, s talked about uh, the subject for another 45 minutes or so. Um, and it's, it can be a little bit hard for me to hear, but I, I wonder if, uh, if anything that um, I talked about tonight sparks any thoughts for you about your own worries of worthiness or unworthiness or your own thoughts about Jesus and worry. Everybody. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll leave it there for tonight. Oh, I'm sorry. I think of an older sister that I know that feels very unworthy. And I think, you know, when we feel ill or are getting older and all, we may get, you know, less confident in ourselves in general, maybe in our physical abilities or whatever. And that's something to try and think about maybe before we get there so that we can try and build our faith and not <coughs> feel, you know, unworthy of, of God's grace, I guess, is kind of part of it. Because there might even be some sin in wallowing in too much worth unworthiness. Just like there is sin in too much, I'm worthy, I'm saved, no matter what, you know, kind of feeling. So, I don't know, I'm just speaking out loud because I was sad because this person has lived a long life of faith and belief and, you know, in her old age, she is questioning herself or her worthiness. <clears throat> yeah, that's, uh, that's really something to think about and wonder how that can happen. If there's some shame in being old and not being able to to do much anymore, feeling unworthy because of that, like as if it's her fault, or looking back on life and thinking, I could have done this, I could have done that, I could have done so much more. Yeah. Well, next week, we will talk about the fears that we can have about money and possessions. Um, I know that uh, that can be the, uh, the root of a lot of worry for a lot of people. So that'll be the subject for, the, for next week. But for now, I'll close with prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for giving us the richness of your scriptures from which we can learn so much if we only look for it. There's so much in the Gospels about the very natural feeling of worry. And it's there for us to uncover and to see and to appreciate your message. We thank you that we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you dealt with worry through your whole life. You dealt with it perfectly. And you understand our hearts. And you are able to show compassion. You do show compassion. Though you may not heal, though you may not Give us a quick answer, resolution to the things that worry us as, as you did 2,000 years ago. We know that you're still able and that you are with each of us and you're holding our hands. We thank you for this time to consider the subject and we pray that you'll go with us in the coming week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, thank you very much, Casey. We appreciate your evening, your thoughts.
Well, thank you, and we will see you, Lord willing, in one week. You bet. Thank you. Hey. Look forward to it. Oh, here, here, here you go, Ray. Oh, gotta make it make. Stop sharing your screen so we can see.